Brethren, I want to speak this afternoon and ask you a question. How can you really know God? I know when I was beginning to be a teenager, I've told you before, I played on the chat piles out from Joplin, Missouri, and climbed hills and sat on top of the chat piles with a kite and looked up into the sky and wondered, why am I here? I really did. I began to go through that kind of stage. And then when my friend Jimmy Mallett, who had been a friend of mine, and we'd wrestled hundreds of hours together, when he got his neck broken, again, wrestling, doing the very thing I did with him so many hundreds of hours, it really shook me. And I began to think, what's going on? Why did God let Jimmy die? Is there a real God? And I know that many of our brethren have the problem they're not really close to God, and sometimes God seems unreal to us. And we've got to understand how to really get close to God, and I want to help you with that because it's a very, very important issue. Do you feel close to God when you pray? Are you always sure that He's there, or do you sometimes doubt even God's existence? Brethren, I just read the other day, as some of you may have done in our local paper, if I can get it out of the right place here, a cutting or clipping. We call it clipping here. The British call it cuttings <laughs> out of the paper from, uh, it was about a month ago, from the Charlotte Observer. Two faces of Mother Teresa. Most of you know her, such a famous Catholic nun who helped and helped in the slums of India and did a lot of good, humanly speaking, just trying to help other people who were sick and had all kinds of horrible things wrong with them. But as the article brings out, she died of a heart ailment at age 82 or 87 back in 1997. Ten years later, a double take occurred when a volume of Mother Teresa's private letters revealed that the tireless, smiling nun spent the last, get this, 39 years of her life, longer than many of you have been alive, the last 39 years of her life in internal agony. Jesus, she wrote, no longer seemed uh, present to her in prayer or in the Eucharist. In letter after letter, she described an unrelenting spiritual dryness, a torturing, quote, torturing pain, end quote. Her smile was as big, a big cloak of deception. She admitted at one point to doubting God's existence. This was Mother Teresa. And I know that many people in the world's religions do have those terrible sense of doubts come along to them, and they have this feeling of, of desperation and even doubting God's existence and all kinds of things about God. But sometimes even our own people have that. And brethren, we should not have that if we're in God's church. But often when we're new, it's normal. You have to grow into a deeper understanding of God. And some of you perhaps need help in going even deeper than you have. So those kinds of feelings virtually never come back on you. Virtually never come back on you. So we should be different. I want to start here by turning to Psalm 33. Psalm 33, I've been going through this process, as many of you know, of seeking God and, and wanting to know God's existence for about 63 years, and perhaps even since 1944, since I began to seek God back during the Second World War. But I've been in God's church since 19. 49, so that goes back about 63 years. As you turn to Psalm chapter 33, Psalm 33, notice just breaking in at verse 18, David said, Behold the eye of the ever-living one, this is Yahweh, the, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, who have that awe of God, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the eternal. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted. And always remember that is used over and over in the Bible because we have trusted in his holy name. His name means everything about him. Let your mercy, O eternal, be upon us just as we hope in you. And yet it's hard to have that trust if you're not even sure that God exists and if you have doubts 
like Mother Teresa had, and all kinds of things come into your mind. That is very, very important. And so every one of us needs to learn to seek God and to prove these things to ourselves. Back in the book of Isaiah, if you turn there to Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah 55, brethren, if you would turn there with me. And let's, I won't be reading all of it, just a few key bait places here, beginning in verse 6. God says, Seek the eternal while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So you're supposed to seek God. And when you have the opportunity, and you better make that opportunity, some people say, I don't have time to pray. What do you mean you don't have time to pray? It means you don't take time to pray. Some say, I don't have time to study. And again, the same thing. One of the busiest and most productive men probably in all human history was Daniel. He was given the responsibility by Nebuchadnezzar to actually guide the situation over the entire Babylonian empire, which was the greatest empire on earth at that time. You better believe he was busy. He had all kinds of things to do, but he prayed to God three times a day, evening, morning, and at noon. King David of Israel did the same thing. They took time to pray, and certainly we need to seek God in many different ways. Seek the eternal. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Be willing to turn from your problems. Grow in grace and in knowledge. Make the changes that you've heard about and Mr. Dr. Winnale uh, talked about in the sermonette. And by the way, I got right into the sermon without mentioning his fine sermonette and without mentioning the outstanding music. I really enjoyed that, Marcus. That was really great, the holy city. And that led right into my sermon, thinking about Jesus Christ giving his life for us in the way he did ought to have great meaning as we seek God and understand fully what that meant. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Eternal. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God does not always think just like we think he should, because his mind is infinite. He created the heavens and the earth. His mind is so greater than our minds, there's no comparison. And I think most of us realize when we think about it that that is the case. So we've got to try to find out how God is, how we can prove him, understand what he thinks, and value that a lot more than many of us do. Very, very important if we want to have eternal life. So how can you trust in God? And again, how can you generally know God and feel close to him? I want to give you five keys Five keys today to help you with this. I could give seven or 14 or 21 or whatever, but I just think we have time today to explain five of them, and it'll be good to have a, or a whole sermon just on each one, of course, sometimes. The first key I want to give you is the one the Bible mentions once most of all, or first of all, and yet that's one of the most neglected ones. Why? Because Satan the devil knew that this is one of the most important ways to identify God and Satan has come along in our modern society and our modern educational system and sought in every way he can to destroy our appreciation for this key. That key is creation. The creation demands a creator. You can't have all the infinite complexities of our creation. You can't have all the overlapping laws and interlocking things going on all through creation without a creator without a great mind. Now, many scientists have begun to realize that, yet there are others, of course, who make fun of it, and they put that down. There are so many things in creation, and I don't have time. It'd be good if we have a whole booklet on that. I hope we would sometime to get our... I tried to talk to Mr. Hegwald and some of our other scientists years ago. We haven't had any top scientists come, but at any rate, we could put together a thorough booklet on that someday with pictures and all kinds of things that might cost money. But that's one of the biggest ways Satan has deceived the world. Back in Romans, if you turn to Romans with me, brethren, here's the way God puts it. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. He says, 
uh, in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They suppress it. The great so-called educators and thinkers make fun of and they suppress the whole concept of your creator. They say, no, we evolved out of the warm ocean slime and lovesick amoebas somehow got together and somehow did this and somehow did that. Well, we say for the last 6,000 years they haven't done anything like that. Well, let's go back a million years. And then other scientists have proved no one wouldn't work. Well, let's go back a billion. Well, how about a trillion? <laughs> you see, somehow all these things are supposed to have happened given enough time, but they don't make sense. They would never have happened. There's anything around to make them happen that way. Anyway, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known by God, obviously through his creation, is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation, here it is, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is tremendous mind, his creative power, his imagination, his, his capacity, his invisible attributes are made known, are clearly seen, it says, being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by what? By the creation, by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God says they're without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, some of the early scientists and some of the early philosophers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, when you really read their works as I did when I was first coming into the truth, they really were fools, absolutely stupid. They had all kinds of unusual imaginations, but Socrates despised women so much he masturbated publicly in the, in, the, in the marketplace to show us disgust for women. They put down marriage. They, they were, many of them, homosexuals. They turned away from everything that is normal and right and sensible. They were fools. And we need to realize that. That's the beginning of a so-called great Western civilization. Greece has been called the cradle of Western civilization. And God says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they not denied the creator and began to worship the creature. And they had various ideas of worshiping various animals and various objects and so on. And in that way, they became fools according to God Almighty. That's his opinion. So there's so many things in creation all the way through that shows there have to be a God because they overlap each other. One simple one, most of you know, the bees and the flowers need one another. You've got to have the pollen out of the flowers to help the bees, and then the bees have to take pollen from one flower to another, and that type of interrelationship, you've got to have one which was created first. They had to be created together. They had to come together. Would, would evolution know all this or something how it did that? Or was there a mind behind all this? Again, that's very simple. I know my wife was showing me that there is this uh, uh, pollen. She's been reading about this uh, uh, greasy uh, stuff that the bees produce. And I better had to write it down, uh, propolis. It's called P-R-O-P-I-L-S, propolis. And there's a kind of a, a, a greasy substance in beehives, and some of it comes from flowers, and then some of it is manufactured by the bees themselves. But when an invading uh, gar uh, a monster or invading little uh, uh, insect or varmint, trying to say, some other little varmint tries to break into the beehive, these things that are in science tell us that what did the bees do? Of course, they evolved and they have no brains, supposedly, or do they? God put certain uh, tendencies in these animals, and they are able to do these things because they have it built right into their mind. And they then automatically, hundreds or thousands of them, get together against this little varmint, and they use this propolis to actually encapsulate this other little varmint and surround him with this gooey stuff where he dies and he is virtually mummified. So he can't 
hurt the, the queen bee or the other bees. They have built in them automatically this knowledge by God himself. Instinct is trying to think of that word. They have the instinct built in them to do that. But no, the scientists would say that's not an accident. They just evolved that way. Oh, really? Somehow over millions of years, some bees figured out something, and they figured out they could go do this and that. That's the way the scientists try to explain the thing. If they can't make it make sense in a thousand years, then they'll try a million years. If they can't make that make sense, they try a billion years. And now we've come up with the word trillion in our national debt <laughs> and everything else. So let's try a trillion years. Is that going to solve the problem? No. Science does not know. The scientists in that way are fools, those who deny the existence of God. That is very, very foolish. That great God has created a magnificent creation, and he shows the type of creative imagination and power and wisdom in the creation. When you study all these things about it that are absolutely magnificent, and it's good for us to understand that. I know that one thing about God, I'm very simple, I'm not a scientist, but I appreciate about the storms we used to have at the college in East Texas. And then my wife and I were over in Switzerland one time in Lugano in southern Switzerland where it's right near the Italian Alps and surrounded by mountains. And in those kinds of settings, sometimes you hear the voice of God. I just love rolling thunder. You know, it just shakes the, the earth and everything around it. And I remember we were over there, and some brethren in the church in London had this flat right overlooking Lake Lugano, and one of the most spectacular storms I've ever seen came up right over the lake. And the thunder was going boom, boom, boom. It was echoing around the mountains. You'd hear boom, 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 boom. Just amazing all around, like the whole lake was surrounded by a series of cannons. The voice of God, because God's voice, God himself says, is like rolling thunder. But, of course, that doesn't prove God. I'm just showing you can begin to think about the power of God and the glory of God a little bit when you think about the power of the ocean and the power of rolling thunder and the power of lightning and the power of earthquakes and the power of hurricanes and so forth. That shows the power behind creation, who made creation. And who made the propolis? And who made the bees? And who made all these other things? In that intricate, overlapping way, you find all through creation. God did. It could not have evolved. There is a creator. And perhaps one of the greatest proofs of God, the greatest proofs of creation of all, if they were willing to admit it, is our human mind. Our human mind I've told you how I got very well acquainted with Dr. Robert Kuhn back when he used to work for David John Hill and me as a researcher, and now he's a top scientist and especially investor and advisor to the whole Chinese government. But he studied brain research, and while he was sitting in my freshman Bible class in Ambassador College, somehow he was called at that time to come up there. He was working on his dissertation for his doctorate in brain research at the UCLA Brain Research over at UCLA. He's a very brilliant person, but he's explained to me in their brain research, they would have the brain of a little, little tiny bird, little bird brain, we say very small. Then you'd have the brain of a rabbit, and then the brain of a dog would be bigger than the brain of a horse or some other animal. And the biggest brains would go up in an ascending, a, a sort of a slowly descending scale, just like that would be the brains of the chimpanzee or the uh, dolphin. And their brains would be bigger. They can't really tell what, who is smarter because the dolphins have no hands and even paws, really, to do anything with. So it's hard to measure. But they sense that they're very smart. Their brain was bigger. And they can chart it by the size of the brain and the degree of the complicated electrical wiring circuit. That's putting it in layman's terms. Robert explained it to me that way so I can understand. The scientists can look in their brain and see the way it's put together. They can figure out and project the mental capacity of any creature. They have their brains in these uh, plastic tubes around. And so then the brain of a human being, and in, in, in relation to the, the other animals, the brain of the human being, the animals kind of go like this, up to a dolphin and a chimpanzee, and then the brain of a human ought to be up here. It ought to be approximately 5 to 8 percent smarter than the dolphin or the chimpanzee. But suddenly it goes into orbit. 
You can't put it on a chart. It's so much bigger than the animal's brain, they don't, they don't understand it. They don't get it. And so Dr. Kuhn's thesis was the, the uh, uh, non-material aspect of the human brain. He didn't want to say spirit. He knew the professors wouldn't like that if you talk about God. So he t wrote it up that way so he could get a good grade, which he did, and graduated. The non-material, I think is the way he worded it, a part of the human brain. The brain goes right off the chart because God Almighty, there is a real God, the Creator God, made us in His image, and He made us in His image in the sense we have two arms and legs and eyes and ears, but our mind has a type of creative imagination like God's mind, like God's mind to a limited degree. No other creature even remotely has that. The scientists want a lot of times. Well, there have been a lot of time for the monkeys and the baboons and the horses and various other kinds of animals to get their mind, and they haven't even invented the wheelbarrow yet. How come they haven't even got wheelbarrows? <laughs> their minds aren't made like our minds. God made our minds. And that is one of the strongest proofs of the Creator of all when you understand it. Think about it, brethren. This can help you picture God. This can help you realize there is a real powerful spirit being that made you in his image. He loves you. He's created you to be his child. He wants you to be in his kingdom. He wants you to be in his family forever. And his inspired word tells us that. So that is one of the major proofs of God. A second major proof is uh, the Bible itself. The Bible reveals God and in the Bible, it tells us about God in so many ways that helps us. So you need to prove to yourself, as we've done, and Dr. Uh, Winnell has a fine book on that, the Bible fact or fiction. Be sure you get that book, let and read it. It's absolutely free and without cost, as we say in all our ads. So, but a lot of you have it, may, may not have studied it very well. So think about the Bible and what it actually says. The Bible says back in John 6, for instance, and let me turn there, in John chapter 6, brethren, and here's a wonderful, very rich passage, as we all know, one of the most deep parts of the Bible anywhere, the middle part of the book of John, beginning in verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh, Jesus said, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He's still going to have to die, but Christ will raise him up. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. This begins to reveal a little bit about how God works. God puts part of his very nature in you through the Holy Spirit. Christ lives his life in you. He abides in me and I in him. Verse 57, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. If you feed on this book, and this book is Jesus Christ in print, in a sense. Christ is the Word as a personality, and this book is the Word in print. You're supposed to feed on this book, to read it regularly. And frankly, as the Bible says, as you know, Romans 10, 17, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. As you feed on this book, not trying to kid yourself, but just seeing how the Bible describes things in a way no other book does remotely. The Book of Mormon doesn't even make sense when you compare it to the Bible. The, the Bhagavad Gita, the Koran, all these other books of these other religions, they don't make sense. I've read parts of them all, and they don't even start to begin to commence to make sense the way the Bible does. Read this book. It's magnificent if you start to read it with that thought in mind and drink in of it. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. And now notice verse 63. He's talking here about the Bible. It is the Spirit who gives life, God's Holy Spirit. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, what are these words? Well, the words here in the Bible. 
These words are spirit and they are life. When you feed on these words, God becomes far more real to you because he describes things all through creation, things all through history, things all through various aspects of life that you can see make sense in a way nothing else does. Another aspect of the Bible, of course, that you need to think about and prove to yourself is referred to in 2 Peter. You're all familiar with it. Let's turn that. 2 Peter chapter 1. He says here in verse 19, 2 Peter 1, 19, we also have the prophetic word made sure, or as the King James words it, the sure word of prophecy which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, or the word is better translated, origin, most of the commentaries say. Prophecy did not come by human origin. It originated from God Almighty. That's how it came. And he goes on to explain, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we've explained to you again and again how the church of God, for instance, Mr. Armstrong, knowing the prophecies about a coming United States of Europe, knowing about the ten toes of Revelation, told the church back when I was in the church and some of our older brethren, I'm sure Mr. Mr. League will remember this, Mr. Davis is sick today or he would remember it, others who were back there Mrs. Uh, Murray, <laughs> I'm sure, remembers how Mr. Armstrong used to talk about the fact that the Eastern European nations would break away from the Soviet Union way before it happened because they would be needed to complete the ten toes of Daniel and complete the ten nations of, of Revelation to comprise the beast power. He said all kinds of things like that. He said that the sea gates would be taken away because God indicates that he was giving us these things, but if we turned away, he would take away most of the blessings or all the blessings. Mr. Armstrong never said all, but as I pointed out, there were eight or ten major sea gates, and now they're all gone but two. The only ones left are Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands, and Argentina is agitating regularly to get the Falklands back. They call them the Malvinas, and Spain's agitating back by the EU to get back Gibraltar. Probably both of them will be gone. How can we know these big things affecting places thousands of miles away, controlled by other nations or whole groups of nations? How can we know that? Well, because this book says so. That's how. All kinds of other things show that this book was inspired by the great God who gives us life, the great God who controls the rise and fall of nations, the great God who made your mind. So use your mind, brethren, please, and you, brethren, hearing this later. This is a key issue. This is a key issue. Everything else will fall by the wayside if you let Satan come in there and put doubt in your mind about the existence of God and keep you from feeling close to your Creator. You say, well, I'm in the church, and I have some problems, you know. Uh, some of these people are not perfect. I see Mrs. Uh, I can pick on her because I know her. I think I can pick on her. Say, Mrs. Murray, she's not perfect. No. And Mr. Meredith, he's not perfect. And my wife can say, amen, Mr. Meredith is not perfect. So I'm going to fall away because someone made a mistake. Yes, we all make mistakes. That has nothing to do with the existence of God. That has nothing to do with all these proofs. There is a real God, and that God has guided our lives and guided this work and is guiding the prophecies and inspired this book. And in that book, he tells us, all men sin and come short of the glory of God. So we all make mistakes. Get over it. Move on. <laughs> that has nothing to do with God's promises. In fact, it just validates God's promises that we are still human. So you need to have great confidence in the God of the Bible. The Bible reveals God, and the Bible makes it very, very clear. Another key is... Uh, to help you understand God and really know God is start keeping God's commandments even better, as Dr. Scott was telling you. Learn and build on the things you learned at the feast. Keep the commandments and walk with God. I'm putting those both together here. Keep the commandments and walk with God. 
Why would I bring that in? Well, because the Bible itself does. Notice now in 1 John, turn to 1 John, if you would, chapter 2. Here, the old, even older than me, apparently, when he wrote this up in his 90s, <clears throat> this aged apostle John, the one whom Jesus had a very special personal love for, wrote this book and talks about love and what it means over and over again. 1 John 2, verse 3. Now, by this we know that we know him. How do you know God? Be if we keep his commandments. You see, if we live that way of life. Notice verse 4. He who says, I know him. Many of these Protestant ministers say, how good it is to know the Lord. And they say they know God. Well, frankly, most of them don't. They may know about God. The Pope at Rome knows about God, but he does not know God. He's not personally acquainted with God because he doesn't do what it says right here. He who says, I know God, and does not keep, not just know about, but keep his commandments, plural, is, not, is a liar, and the truth of God is not in him. Why would God say that, brethren? I want to spend time so you get what it means here. If you walk in that way of God, you have to study and pray. You have to have the help of God's Holy Spirit. You have to fight your human nature. You have to overcome your human nature and the world and Satan the devil. And as you do that, in order to keep God's commandments... And you won't keep them all perfectly, but you'll keep them all in general as a way of life. And ever more perfectly, the longer you live, hopefully, the more you grow in grace and in knowledge. It will be your way of life. And in doing that, you will come to know God. How so? Because you will begin to experience what it's like to think like God, to act like God, to do like God in every single situation of your life. You will have Christ living in you. You will have to walk with God and have Christ living in you and experience the Holy Spirit living in you and Christ living in you in order to keep the commandments, you see. So if you keep the commandments, you will come to be intimately acquainted with God. You will have been wrestling with God like Jacob did physically, but you will be doing it spiritually, and you will be wrestling with yourself and your human nature, and with Satan at the same time. You will be striving with your being to love God with all your heart and strength and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself all day long, every day. That's hard. But with God's Spirit in you, you will begin to experience what God's character is like, and through that experience and that relationship with God, which enables you to do that, you will come to know God. You will be acquainted with God. You will sense the closeness you have with God by this very practice of walking with God and consciously letting Christ live his life in you. I can't resist, of course, my favorite verse, as you know, Galatians 2.20. The Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. And, of course, in the beautiful introductory song about Christ dying for us on the cross. He did that. God himself came down from heaven and died and was writhing in agony like they, us little boys used to uh, grab a, a, a grasshopper and put pins in him. We were wicked little boys. That's what Christ let happen to him, like little boys tormenting a grasshopper and slowly dying to pay the penalty of our sins, God's love in that way. So you come to understand God by going through this process of letting Christ live his life in you. That is so important. That's so important. So you've got to walk that way of life. And as you do walk that way of life, then you will come to know God, not just know about God, but everything else will fall into place. You will then see, well, God allowed me to get sick back there because of this or that. God allowed this bad thing to happen back there because of this or that. I wasn't growing. I needed to learn a lesson. I needed to be closer to God. And you can honestly see that in most cases. I can't say in all cases. Some cases we may yet under, not understand until the resurrection. But everything in creation will begin to make sense 
if you walk with God and think like God and act like God, then God lives in you. And therefore, you will come to know God. And when you get down on your knees and you say, Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, the Father's right hand, it becomes very real to you, very real to you that they are there and they're guiding you, leading you, fashioning you, molding you, working with you to make you full sons of God in his kingdom, in his family forever. It will become very real to you. So we want to understand that aspect, and I hope all of us uh, can. So this is in 1 John 2, and now let's turn to 1 John 1, going back just to chapter 1. And John was saying here, this is the message in verse 5, this is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you, that God is light. That's something else about God. God is total brilliance and righteousness and beauty. And you look around at the beautiful, magnificent things in the creation, out in the Milky Way, and on out in all the creation beyond, around the universe. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And he's talking most of all about character, of course. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and brethren, we do need to learn to have fellowship with God in fervent Bible study, in fervent heartfelt prayer on our knees, crying out to God like Jesus did, then through that process and having Christ live in us, God becomes more real and we know and know and know that we know God. We're acquainted with him. He doesn't seem distant in that way at all. So it says we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth if we say we have fellowship and walk in darkness. But verse 7, if we walk in the light, and that's what God wants us to do, as he is in the light, we walk with God, we talk with God, we commune with God, and through Christ in us, we fellowship with God and with Christ. We interact with them in this life, and finally, when we're made spirit, we just simply go to a higher level, and we interact with them and even see them and, and talk to them face to face as part of the family of God. We just move it to a higher level because we've been doing it all the time. It's not a stranger we've been dealing with. It's someone we've really got to know intimately. So we need to think about it in that way. So if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. How's our fellowship? I've told you before, when I came to Ambassador College, there was not one single human being there in the student body that I would have been good friends with back in Joplin, Missouri. Was I better? No, probably worse than some of them. They were just different. Herman Hay was the, Herman, the book, I think, as Mr. Armstrong called him. He was always into studying and research, and Ken Herman was a bachelor farmer from Milwaukee, and we had Dick Armstrong, who was kind of unusual in his approach and understanding, and I became a good friend with Dick. He and I were most alike, because we were both carnal. <laughs> he was used to riding around and doing things, and I was too, but I probably would not have been one of his good friends in high school for other reasons, and all to go down the line. I did, must not analyze everyone, but each one was different. And, but we, I came to love those fellows, I mean love them. I think about them to this day. Quite often their thoughts would come back to mind. I liked them. I didn't just love them spiritually. I liked them. And I came to realize the good was in them because we both were changing and growing to be like God and learn God's way of life. And so that was good. And God helped us do that. And we had fellowship with one another. Why? Because our fellowship was through God and through Christ. Our fellowship didn't begin on the junior high basketball team and then carry on over into high school or dating the same girls or living in the same neighborhood. Our fellowship was an entirely different matter. We came to give our lives to a common purpose, to achieve a common goal, and so that superseded all the physical differences we had. Herman had no interest in dances or parties or whatever, and lots of what I regarded as normal things, and many of the other fellows the same way. Some of them did, especially Dick, 
but he had a different way of going at it. But we became dear friends and loved ones because we had a common goal. Our fellowship was through God and through Christ. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It's a present continuous tense. It, it's not that he did cleanse us. He cleanses us he, day by day, year by year. He keeps cleaning us up as we get down on our knees and ask our Father in heaven for help, for guidance, for mercy, for forgiveness. He keeps cleaning us up. He keeps making us like he is. And that way we're walking with God, we're walking with Christ, and we're walking with one another toward that same goal a deep, profound fellowship we can have in God's church, superseding all of the human fellowships. So this is how we come to know God and to know that we know him by keeping his commandments and walking with God. Another key is answered prayer. Answered prayer, and I'll not spend a horrible lot of time on this because I've given you some of these examples and I could try to get some new ones. By the way, we had a tremendous miracle occur at the feast in Chattanooga, and maybe if Monica's here, she can help me find it. I think I left that right up on my desk. I wanted to, I kind of hate myself when I do those things. But anyway, it's, it was about two ladies in the feast over there that were supernaturally, dramatically healed by God. And one of the elders that prayed for them was Mr. Franklin Fry, just a very dedicated elder from our Walterboro con congregation just inspiring, and I wanted to use that in the sermon, and I plan to use that, I think, even in the semi-annual letter. So those are two of the most unusual miracles that we've had. The disease was so unusual that I've not heard of it, so I can't remember it. <laughs> but my wife, my wife had to write out this uh, propolis word for me about the bees and this unusual disease, but it was a terrible disease these ladies had, and God healed them both within a period of hours of each other. So it was a wonderful thing, and God is beginning to heal, we hear here and there. We wish he would heal more. And again, I remind you, because some of you can get discouraged and say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so died. I know that. I hate that. I mean that. I don't like that. But most of the brethren, as you know, who have died have been in their mid-60s or upper 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s. God does let people die, as I've said, all over the world, and has always done, and most of them die somewhere between 65 and 85. And I'm getting close to 85, so I can still say that. God may keep me alive beyond that. That's entirely in God's hands. But most of them die in that period of time. God does not let all of us live up like Mr. Party and to live to be 94, or Mr. Armstrong live to be 93. That's unusual. That's not that people are in some terrible trouble if they die a little bit earlier. And we must not be discouraged by the normal process of life and death and eating and breathing and sleeping and the need for exercise, all the things that we need. I was hearing the news this morning on national public radio, and then right after that, I don't always listen to this other stuff on the Sabbath, but they got into this, it's called the People's Pharmacy. Some of you have heard that program on national. It's a very good program when they get into various aspects of disease, and they sometimes interview the top people in the world. And they had this top doctor from Cleveland Clinic, who's a heart specialist, and he and his friend have written a, a book on that. And they were asking him, well, why is the heart attacks or the heart attacks so much worse now than they used to be? And I thought he was going to give some complicated answer. But he said he and Dr. So-and-so, his friend, had studied that for years. And he said, we've come to realize that when you boil it down, it's two main reasons. And one of them I've been agitating for for years, so I don't take credit. The world knows this long before I came along. But the first one, as he said, back in the 1800s and the early 1900s, the men were out working in the farms and construction and getting exercise, and the women were going all over the house and climbing and doing their washing by hand and climbing stairs, and everybody was walking to the store, walking next door, walking here and there, and now we don't do that anymore. We get in our car, even if we need to go just two blocks, we jump in a car. We don't get exercise. The heart is a muscle, and the heart needs regular exercise. He says that's probably the main reason why the heart attack rate and the heart death rate is the number one killer, because people won't exercise. Secondly, 
is smoking. And I didn't realize this. He said smoking got worse during the Depression back in the 1930s because people were all frustrated. And then it got much worse during the Second World War. Again, I think I'd heard this but forgot to think about it. The government actually issued whole millions of packages of cigarettes for free to the military. The thought it would relieve their stress. Lots of men came into the military not smoking, and here were people passing out whole packages of cigarettes for nothing. And so millions of Americans got to smoking and smoking and smoking and puff puffing away during those years of the 1930s and 40s. And then, as he said, the habit of smoking is one of the hardest to break. It's so hard to break away from smoking once you started. But anyway, those are the two big reasons he gave. Then others are there too. Little sidelight. But when we break God's laws, there is an effect. Again, it shows, you know, God tells us to exercise. And what did Christ do? You look in the Gospels, Jesus walked in Galilee. He was no longer walking in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him, but he walked in Galilee. You see scriptures all through like that. Christ walked here and Christ walked there. And instead of getting on the boat and going around this peninsula, Paul walked across the peninsula. Then they met him on the other side. He didn't have to. He walked and Jesus walked and Abraham walked. And all those men and women back there got lots and lots of walking every day. We need to walk. I'm preaching to you here. <laughs> we need to walk and we need to exercise and you will live longer if you do. So let's do that, all of us, as best we can. That may keep us from dying of a heart attack. Anyway, God intended the human body to get exercise and we've tried to change. Answered prayer. As you walk with God, you will have more answered prayer continually, and you, most of you know that. Again, I could describe Howard Clark, sat over here on my right as I preached for long, many years in the Shakespeare Club, paraplegic, quadriplegic, couldn't walk or move his arms or anything. Suddenly he just healed over the Pentecost weekend, 1958. Bang, he's up. Dick Armstrong anointed him. It was almost as God was telling us, Dick is okay. God gave Dick three unusual miracles just before he died. And there may have been a special reason why God allowed Dick to die. Not that he was so bad. He was one of my best friends, but God allowed that. But he gave a good signal about Dick and did three miracles through him just before that. Then we've heard of Mrs. Beam, B-E-A-M, like a beam back in Salt Lake City, who had one breast totally removed from breast cancer, went right back to the same clinic. She didn't go to a chiropractor. She went to a big specialized uh, clinic there dealing with that, all kinds of medical treatment. And they said the cancer had moved into her other breast and finally it got worse and worse and worse. And her body was beginning to have that cancer smell and that brownish look to her skin, whole rotations of church ladies were taking care of her. She got worse and worse. And finally she was screaming and crying and clawing the walls. The pain got so worse. And she called the minister over finally for the upteen time and said, please pray that God will please let me die right now if he's not going to heal me. Heal me now or let me die. I can't take it. And so he prayed the praying his prayer he'd ever prayed. I think he told me in a general way. And the ladies were crying. They were helping her. She was crying. And all of a sudden, her hands had been like this, just clawing herself. And actually, they said she was sometimes bringing blood to her face. She was clawing her face, clawing the walls. And all of a sudden, she stopped. And she stood there. And I said, was it immediate? He said, no. She sort of stood there for, it seemed like forever, but it was maybe one or two minutes and then she kind of went like this. She said, it's gone. And it was gone. Was gone. Right then. I've told you about the lady with the withered arm. Raymond McNair and I met on the baptizing tour back in 1951 and brought her Baptist friend. Her, her arm had never grown out. And she got an anointed cloth from Mr. Armstrong that did grow out. I don't tell you the rest of the story. I've told you about how I had the privilege of anointing Dennis Brady's little daughter, one of my students, who was a married student and had this little daughter. And Dennis came to freshman class late one day, and I found him out in the lobby there at the, the music hall we were using. 
uh, for the class. And he said, Mr. Meredith, I'm sorry I missed the class. My little daughter's dying. I said, what? And he was very earnest and like he'd been crying. And he said, she has the fatal variety of spinal meningitis. Well, I'm a newspaper reader. My wife probably will tell you I'm a newspaper fiend. I read the newspaper all the time. So I had definitely, I promise you, read in the Los Angeles Times the fatal variety of spinal meningitis was going around. That's what she had. And a medical doctor had taken blood tests and other tests, and that was what she had, the fatal variety of that. And she was going like this and having convulsions. And Dennis asked me to come out, and I did, and I anointed her. She'd been anointed, but he asked me to come. And in great stress and passion, because she was a little girl like my little girl, Elizabeth, I came out and I prayed very fervently, and then she went to sleep. I noticed she quit going like this, but we weren't sure she was healed. So after visiting a few minutes, I went home. And the next day, her mother called me, at the office, he said, Mr. Meredith, we weren't sure to tell you she was healed. She just went to sleep. She slept, I think she said, 14 hours. <laughs> she woke up, no fever, no spinal meningitis. She was hungry, and now she's up playing. She's well. And she came to service the following Sabbath. I had a man right next door or down a couple rows in Big Sandy. Won't mention the name. He's probably still alive. Might be around somewhere, though he left the church. But I know it at his little daughter, who was about to die, and the doctor said that. She had about all kinds of things wrong with her stomach and digestion, and she got down to only a few meals she could eat. And I have to give my wife credit on this, because my wife, if she starts praying for you, you better beware. God may heal you, because <laughs> she's been very passionate about things like that. And she was passionate about this little girl. And she prayed and even fasted, and while she was fasting for the little girl, one day, she knew her right down the row on Faculty Row there in Big Sandy. Why then, she said, God, if it's uh, your will to heal the little girl, have her mother call me. I forget the mother's name just as well. Right away, the phone ran, and she says, oh, Jeannie, my husband will come right over. It wasn't Jeannie, I think. It was some other name. She said, I'll, my husband, I mean, will be right over. So she said, Rod, you've got to go over and pray for that little girl. God's going to heal her. I got my marching orders <laughs> from my wife, and I'd prayed for her too before because she got me on that, but she'd prayed more than I had. So I went over, and I prayed for her, and she too had been like this, and she couldn't sleep at night because her stomach was constantly nodding. She had alternate vomiting and diarrhea, and her body was just convulsing, and her stomach was convulsing. She was losing weight, losing weight, and was dying. And so after the anointing, I sat there in their living room a little bit with the, the father and mother, and the little girl was on the father's lap, I think. And I noticed they looked kind of happy or something, but I didn't ask them. The next day, uh, the mother called my wife, or me, I think she called you, and she said, you know, we sensed that our little daughter was healed right after Mr. Meredith's prayer, but we weren't sure, so we waited. But she said, Danny noticed that it was, she relaxed. That night, she just spread all out like a little girl, slept like a rock. She usually would all knotted up like this all night long, couldn't stretch out, couldn't relax, couldn't sleep. She was healed by God Almighty. But people are healed supernaturally in our age by the prayers of many of us. And I'm sure that Mr. League and Mr. Ames and many of our older ministers have had people healed by their prayers. God is the healer. Our prayers are being answered. They're just not being answered as fast and as dramatically as we'd like. So we do want to understand that, brethren, and we want to understand that God does hear our prayers. We also had all kinds of other things of answered prayer in the past that I've told you. I think I told you when I was student body president in the early 1950s in Ambassador College, the money would just drop way down sometimes, and the coworker letter had already gone out, and the response had already come. What did we do? Did we send another letter out? No, there wasn't any internet. There wasn't any way of getting out real quick. We simply prayed, and I called a student body fast, and Annie Mann, the house mother, who Mrs. Apartian knew very well, and Mr. Homburger and some of the others around who heard about it, they would join us, some of the other leading members 
and all of a sudden the money would start coming in. Why? Because we prayed and fasted. That's why all those things, all those years, brethren, help me know that God is real. God is there. God answers prayer. He's answered my prayers over and over again. He doesn't always answer as dramatically or as quickly as I would like, but he's guided my life in a magnificent way for 63 years. He's put up with this old hard head Meredith, and he's worked with me, helped me, delivered me again and again and again, and I can't deny that. God is there, and he is your father if you've given your life to him, but don't ever give up on God. He will not give up on you. He's made you in his image to be his full sons. You will have answered prayer if you can learn that and really believe in God and put your faith and trust in God as God tells us to so many times. Well, let's say Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the eternal. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him. And brethren, as we get to know God and walk with God, we honestly can rejoice. We can say, wow, God did it again. He's doing it again and again and again. He's intervening all over this world and bringing about these things that I've been preaching about for 60 years. It's exciting. I learned most of them from Mr. Armstrong, absolutely. But I started preaching right after my graduation 60 years ago last summer. So I've been preaching these things for over 60 years, and I've seen them happen. So he is very powerful. On those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine, God will keep you and me alive in the coming famine if we trust in him. Our soul waits for the eternal. He is our help and our shield, for our hearts shall rejoice in him, because why? We have trusted You've got to learn to really trust in God. Build this faith. Think about these points I'm giving you and go to God and cry out to God. Pour out your heart to God. Ask for extra faith. Ask for that sense of knowing God and use these keys to get to know God better because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O eternal, be upon me. Now let's go to Psalm 34, if you would. And I want to read beginning here in verse 14. No, 13. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the eternal hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The eternal is near to those who have a broken heart. And brethren, I have found that sometimes when I've been really down and hurting, and really, you know, humble because of that, and seeking God and asking for mercy, that's sometimes the time God will heal me quickest of all. As I'm fat and sassy and everything's going well, somehow we don't cry out with the same heartfelt prayer that we would under the other circumstances. Who, he hears those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yes, we will have afflictions, we will have colds and flus and viruses and serious troubles, sometimes cancer, heart attacks. God will let some die before the three score and 10. Yes, many, but the eternal delivers them out of them all. Sometimes it will be in the resurrection. So that's not real, but all this other is very real to you. So you better believe in that too. That is going to happen. He guards all his bones. None of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The eternal redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. We've got to tr trust with all our hearts in God who gives us life. He wants us to do that, and if we do that, brethren, we will have so many answers to prayer and God will make it so real to us that it is God doing it. And then the final point I want to give you is that Jesus Christ reveals God. Jesus Christ, how do you know God? You know him through Jesus Christ. It's so important to grasp that fact 
and to understand how important that is, as we heard in the opening song here. But let's turn at this point, if you would, to Matthew 11, Matthew chapter 11, and beginning in verse 27. Matthew 11, 27, Jesus said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So God has opened most of your minds, or you would not be here. You should know God, the vast majority of you, but you need to know him better. You need to have a more intimate relation by seeking God with all your heart, as we read back there in Isaiah. And Jesus reveals the, the details of God in a way that nothing else does. Turn back to John chapter 14 now, beginning in verse 5. John chapter 14 and beginning in verse 5. Jesus said in verse 4, Where I am, where I go, you know, and the way you go. And Thomas said to him, here's old doubting Thomas again. <laughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not where you are going, and how can we know the way? John 14 now, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They don't come through Mohammed. They don't come through Lord Buddha, as they call him. They don't come any other way. I'm sorry if these people don't like it. They don't come any other way to the living God, the Creator God. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient. He wanted God to reveal himself as some vision. Jesus said, Have you been with me so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen, get it, has seen the Father. How can you say, then, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The works or the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. How am I able to heal the sick, raise the dead, stop the storm, walk on the water, all the other things? Because there is a great God and he is helping me and empowering me in a way that no other human being has ever been, Jesus is saying. That ought to show you that the God is with me. He said here, verse uh, 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The works that I, sp words that I speak to you, I do not speak, but the Father tells me. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. These powerful miracles done only by Jesus the Christ. And when he died, brethren, suddenly a new religion began to grow and took over the Roman Empire, and great emperors were, were, were trembling in a sense, and finally it literally took over, and the Roman emperor was forced to adopt it as the official religion of the government, although it was watered down. Was there a man named Jesus Christ? Some of these idiots come along and try to even question that. Of course there was. A tremendous movement swept across the whole Western world because this man named Jesus Christ did all these things, and people were electrified by it, and it changed the whole Western world. They used to set little baby girls out to freeze to death. They didn't need them as warriors. When Christianity, even the false Christianity, came along, that stopped all kinds of things like that stopped. The gladiatorial games where men would kill each other in an arena, that stopped. All kinds of other things stopped. Because to the degree that men and women follow this book, their lives are better. Most of them don't follow it very much. But to the degree they follow it, their lives have been better all over this earth. Because this book is from Almighty God, the Creator. That's why. And so we need to understand that. So again, go back here in verse 9. Have, have been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And brethren, as you read carefully through the harmony of the Gospels, and you see how Jesus all day long was loving people, helping people, healing people, blessing people, and forgiving people, and being patient and merciful with people, you see God. 
you see how God himself would do. And yet you see that Jesus was not a sissy. He was not a pushover. When he went into the temple and those men were turning his father's house, which was the temple, into a big old place of selling and buying and making money, he ripped over their tables and the money was splashed everywhere. He got a whip of cords and drove the animals out. He said, take these things hence. Why didn't these men beat him up? Frankly, I think there are a lot of reasons. One reason, Jesus was not a sissy. He'd worked hard all his life, and he'd been a carpenter and a stonemason, probably rippling with muscles. But he had these other 12 men with him, and, and they may not have been right there at that time, but he had a sense of authority about him, and God convicted them. They didn't try to do anything. They were upset. Get out of here, he told them. He told the scribes and the Pharisees, you snapes, you vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? When he had to condemn, he would do that also. He was not nicey nice. But to those who were willing to listen, and the average person, they saw a man constantly giving, helping, serving, who had no house, no property, not a place to lay his head, so to speak, and he was out there giving his life, laying down his life for his fellow man in a remarkable way all day long for 33 and a half years. He set the example. He showed the way God thinks, the way God is. He condemned the things God would condemn. He blessed the things God would condemn. Jesus was the God of the Old Testament. And when you read what he did there, you say, oh my, he really beat up on people. Yes. If pagan nations were, were, in a sense, torturing their own children, cutting out the hearts of their virgin daughters, as they were doing down here in Mexico, and holding them up before the God as the blood dripped down and the drums were beating so that God would bless the spring harvest, Jesus would condemn that powerfully. And in the Old Testament, he simply cut off those nations and had them exterminated. You say, that's not good. Yes, it was good. And it is especially good when you understand the great white throne judgment and that part of God's plan. All he has to do is say, bring up pink file 13, and they'll all be alive again, and they'll understand. That tremendous understanding. Christ is revealed in the Old Testament. He's revealed in the New Testament. He's revealed in the book of Revelation. Think about the Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. He's powerful. He's not a sissy. But he says, if you will keep my commandments, you will enter eternal life. He tells us to have God walk with him. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. If you focus on that and let Christ live his life in you through the Holy Spirit, you will come to know God. And in that way then, following Christ's example of getting up early while it is yet dark and praying every day on your knees, praying throughout the day, drinking into this book, which is Christ in print. You will then begin to walk with God, talk with God, commune with God, and you will know God in a way you have never known before. And I hope all of you will do that because he promised us eternal life and glory in his very family if we will live that way and do those things.